Good evening all and welcome. It's safe to say truck drivers have seen a few things, and tonight we're going to be recounting some of their eerie stories, so get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This is the story of John Galt, a truck driver whose name became infamous in the wake of a tragic accident. Two weeks prior to this fateful event, Team Master Locals 823 had initiated a strike against Tri-State Motors, a trucking company based in Joplin, Missouri. Despite the ongoing strike, Tri-State Motors persisted its operation. On September 30th, 1979, John Galt, a 48-year-old truck driver, was at the helm of a truck leased to Tri-State Motors. Little did he know his journey that day would end in catastrophe. His truck was loaded with over 20 tons of dynamite bound for a mining area in southeast Missouri. Suddenly, shots pierced the air within Gout's truck, setting off a chain reaction of events that would reverberate throughout the region. The resulting explosion was cataclysmic, shattering windows up to 12 miles away in Springfield, Missouri. Along Interstate 44, a crater measuring 50 feet wide and 30 feet deep marked the epicenter of the devastation. Fragments of the truck were strewn about, some found as far as a quarter of a mile away from the explosion site. Tragically, John Galt lost his life instantaneously in the blast. The perpetrator of this senseless act was eventually apprehended, stating he had no idea the truck was carrying dynamite and had only intended to disable it. However, justice prevailed, as he was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 99 years behind bars. Thus, the name of John Galt became forever linked to this tragic chapter in history. My late stepfather was a truck driver. Back in the 80s, he would used to be a log trucker for my uncle in British Columbia and would haul logs around Sikamoose and Kelowna. He used to drive at night long hours on little sleep and lots of coffee. He claimed that one time he had fallen asleep at the wheel while hauling and woke up three hours later having arrived at his destination with no recollection of how he made it there alive without causing accidents at all. He also told me stories about the hallucinations he would have while driving on such little sleep. But above all, it would be seeing people on the road, strange creatures, monsters, and animals that weren't all just in his head. Thankfully, he would pull over and try and rest, but it was a miracle that the man managed to live through that, to be honest. My dad used to drive trucks and he used to tell a story of his scariest time on the road. He was driving when I was around five and my brother three. He did so to make money to take care of us, which also meant that he needed to be able to actually make it home for his kids at the end of the day. He was once driving up the side of a mountain that apparently genuinely resembled one ripped right from a Bugs Bunny cartoon. It spiraled up, had these rickety, flimsy metal guardrails that had smart cars been invented would have still not prevented them from vaulting over the thing, let alone a semi. It was insane o'clock at night, and my dad was super tired, but he wanted to push it so that he could come home faster. What happened next woke him the heck up. So much so that if I recall correctly, he had to take an hour break on the side of the road just to collect whatever was left of his sanity. So, he was making his way up the mountain when on his radio he hears what he swore was flying Frenchman, followed by a whole bunch of hooting and hollering. My dad apparently wasn't confused by the exclamation for long, as mere seconds later, two full-sized, seemingly fully loaded semis came barreling down the mountain, on each side of the road. My dad had to make a quick decision. Cliff or Rockface. There was hardly a shoulder, but it'd be almost certainly crashing into the side of the mountain. So he did what he could to avoid them the best he could and went for the bank. 
My dad said that he turned the wheel as quickly but carefully as he could towards the extremely narrow embankment on his side. He did everything he could to avoid skidding and narrowly avoiding the closest guy. He apparently also narrowly avoided jackknifing the truck and the scariest part of it all, his own semi had tipped during the procedure. All of the wheels on one side of his truck got air as he was sure he had just tipped the truck down a bloody mountain. Also, these two arsewipes could have a messed up game of chicken. So the scariest thing my dad said he has ever seen while driving was a pair of flying Frenchmen. I used to drive I-80 between San Francisco and Cheyenne, Wyoming a lot. It's about 16 to 20 hours of driving depending on the weather and the traffic. One time I got at the rest stop to stretch my legs and take a leak, maybe buy a Coke. I go into the bathroom and there are three beefy bearded dudes, all naked from the waist down, doing things to each other in a daisy chain. I look at them, two of them look up at me, and one of them keeps going, and the other one's eyes went wide as hell. I apologized and walked right back out. All that I could think of, oddly enough, was, wow, that floor is probably filthy. A second time I was driving at night, and the car starts making an odd grinding noise, like I ran over something that got stuck. It's about 2am and I pulled into a rest stop. It was well lit, and I wake my buddy who was sleeping. I explain it to him, and we both exit the vehicle, and hear what sounds like a kid crying. There are no cars at the rest stop, but we frequently heard stories about child trafficking and kidnapping nearby, so we decide to check it out. We grab our flashlights and head towards the noise, which was coming from the bathrooms. As we got closer, we realized it was coming from the women's bathroom. It's a low, dull sobbing. We're preparing for the worst. We walk in, expecting to seem some brutally beaten and or attacked child or something. But we find nothing. But the sound is still there, clearly coming from the bathroom, which is empty. We turn on the lights, check each stall, the trash can, nothing. We even start looking for where in the room it's coming from. We can't find it. Is it a hidden speaker? Are we on candid camera? My buddy climbs up on one of the stalls to get to the top window in the rest stop, which is vented out and open. He closes it and the noise stops. Completely. He opens it, and the noise is no more. We sit there for a few seconds staring at each other. He shrugs. Then the window slams shut again without him touching it. We are out of that bathroom in seconds. The noise begins again ten seconds later as we get to the car. As we're tearing out of the parking lot within 10 seconds, the grinding noise is still there. So this time I pull over a few miles later at a Flying J truck stop. Well lit, sometimes occupied. There are a few truckers there, not other civilians like us, and we check under the vehicle. There's a red and silver piece of metal wedged between the car and part of the road, about half an inch or so off the ground. So with us in the car, it definitely would have been grinding against the ground. We can't remove it by hand as it's really wedged in there, so we kick and bend it and figure we'll remove it when we get back. A week later, I take it to a mechanic, and it was part of a kid's tricycle. The red area where someone can stand on the back. I don't know why, and I don't think they're connected or anything, but those moments for me really messed me up. I'm a long-haul trucker. I see and deal with a lot of weird and scary stuff. And this happened when I was traveling up US 93 in Nevada, heading to Portland, Oregon for a delivery. It was around 1.30 in the morning, and I needed to stop and log my half hour break. I found a white spot and pulled off, did my logs up, and made myself a sandwich. While I was eating said sandwich, I noticed a vehicle pull in behind me. I did not get too concerned about it, but kept one eye on it while I ate. Then it got strange. I noticed a figure in the headlights of the vehicle approach the back driver's side of my trailer, stop, and looked like they were rubbing the back side of my trailer with their hand. 
Suspicious. I got up my pistol from my lockbox back in my sleeper, cocked it and locked it, slid it behind my waistband and proceeded to climb out of my rig. I walked about 10 feet back, kept my hand on the butt of my pistol and flicked my flashlight on and aimed it at the person. It was a man. A weird looking fellow in a dirty whitish trench coat with long straggly hair who was bald on top. He was rubbing something on the side of my trailer and I hollered at him to stop what he was doing. He looked up at me and smirked and without turning his gaze off me started walking my way. I backed my way to my door keeping my hands on my pistol but not pulling it out. I did not feel like my life was in danger at that time. I opened the door, climbed into the rig, and shut the door and locked it. The dude walks up to my door, looks at me, still smiling. He must be off his rockers, I'm thinking. My half hour break is over and it was time to go. However, while I'm looking down at him and getting ready to turn the key, I feel my truck rock. I jump and look in my driver's side mirror, and there was nothing. I look over to check my passenger side mirror and there on my step, face pressed to my window, is a freaky, perfect replica of an old witch smiling. Rotten teeth, cocking her head to the left, then right and fogging up my window. Needless to say, I about sucked my seat up to my ass, but that's not the end of it. The dude then jumps up on my driver's side step and starts licking my window. Then the witch lady starts smacking my window with the palm of her hand over and over. The dude starts telling me to open up, and I'm feeling threatened. I pull my pistol out, and the chick immediately disappears off the passenger side step. But the dude laughs, jumps up and down on my step and grins, and touches his finger to his nose. Then, jumps off the step. I fired my truck up and took the hell off. I never did see any headlights following me though, thank goodness. My grandfather, a former Air Force serviceman, recounted a chilling experience from his time in the service. One night as he was driving back to his base, he encountered something that defied explanation. It was around 2am when he spotted a woman standing by the side of the road dressed in a white flowing gown. Concerned for her well-being, he circled back to her to offer assistance, but when he returned, she had vanished without a trace. Perplexed and determined to ensure her safety, he spent nearly an hour searching the area fruitlessly before reluctantly giving up and continuing on his journey back to the base. As he resumed driving, a strange premonition came over him urging him to change lanes despite the absence of any visible hazards. Trusting his instincts, he switched lanes just in time to avoid a collision with a stalled truck that lacked any warning lights at all. The realization struck him hard. Had he remained in the original lane, he would have smashed into that truck and the consequences would have likely been very fatal. To this day, my grandfather remains convinced that the mysterious woman in white was more than a mere apparition. He sees her appearance as a profound warning, an omen that potentially saved his life that night. It's a story he shares rarely, but that underscores the inexplicable and often unexplained events that can shape our lives in profound and mysterious ways. A relative of mine is a trucker and shared this story with me. It was between 1 and 4 a.m. when they were driving along a desolate stretch of road when they noticed a man walking on the opposite side. He was a figure dressed in a black jacket, jeans and dark hair. It struck them as odd. Why would anyone be walking out here so late in the middle of nowhere? But he tried not to dwell on it and continued driving. About three minutes later, to their bewilderment, they spotted the same man again, now walking on their side of the road. Perplexed, they kept driving, trying to shake off the unnerving feeling creeping over them. But then, after a few minutes, there he was once more, walking down the same road. 
my relative accustomed to long hours on rural roads, and often the designated driver due to their ability to function on minimal sleep, started feeling a knot of unease forming in their stomach. Seeing the man for a fourth time was the tipping point. They decided to pull over and take a nap, attributing the bizarre sightings to exhaustion. As they drifted into sleep, a sharp knock on the window startled them awake. Despite years of facing various challenges fearlessly, my relative was shaken to the core. They looked at me with eyes wide with terror, recounting how the man with dark piercing eyes had knocked on their window. It was an encounter that defied logic and reason, leaving them unnerved in a way I had never seen before. Since that chilling night, my relative adamantly refused to drive on that particular road again, and they remained tight-lipped about the location, evading any mention of the incident with an unease that hanged palpably in the air. It's a story I only ever heard once, as they would quickly change the subject or leave the room whenever it's brought up, clearly haunted by the memory of that terrifying encounter, and I don't blame them. In 2017, during one of my routes, I made a stop at Love's Gas Station in Emerson, Georgia, about 20 minutes outside of Atlanta. It was late in the evening, and I decided to take a break and rest and grab a quick meal from a nearby fast food joint. As I sat in my truck unwinding and checking my phone, I was interrupted by a knock on my door. I cautiously opened it to find a disheveled woman who appeared homeless, her weathered face suggesting that she was in her 50s or 60s and definitely living rough. She greeted me with an unsettling proposition, suggesting we could help each other out. Confused and uneasy, I asked how, and without missing a beat, she offered her special female services. I sensed trouble and declined, urging her to leave and hoped that that would be the end of our conversation. Relieved to be alone again, I resumed my break for another half hour trying to shake off the uncomfortable encounter. But my sense of unease returned when out of nowhere, someone tried to force their way into my truck. This time, the intruder wore a scream mask, instantly triggering alarm bells in my head. I reacted instinctively, pushing the mask assailant away and locking the door. I knew it was the woman though, she was wearing the exact same thing. At this point I'd had enough, my heart was racing and I started the engine and prepared to leave, assuming the threat had retreated into the night. However, the night was far from over. As I resumed my journey and merged back onto the highway, other drivers began honking and gesturing urgently towards the rear of my truck. Perplexed and scared, I pulled over at the next safe opportunity. Stepping out cautiously, I used my flashlight to scan the surroundings, and that was when I spotted her. The same woman was now attempting to flee after being caught. Somehow, she had managed to cling onto the back of my truck as I drove away from the gas station. The sight was surreal and unsettling, leaving me shaken by the audacity and persistence of her actions. What her true intentions were? I guess I'll never know. Part of me thinks she was trying to do something to get into the cab, anything, in order to maybe steal my money, or the contents of the trailer, or who knows what. If that were the case, I suspect she had helpers nearby if things went her way, but I'm glad that I never got to find out what exactly her true intentions were. I grew up in rural Washington, right off the highway in the middle of nowhere. I was doing my homework in the kitchen when the collision happened. It sounded like a bomb went off and shook the whole house. My stepmother at the time told us to sit tight and took off running up the driveway. It was more of a short dirt road to see what happened. Turns out my older stepbrother and stepsister were driving home from their school and had slowed down on the highway to turn into our driveway as there was no turning lane, just one lane in each direction, which caused a small amount of traffic. Behind them, a semi came speeding around the corner, saw the slower vehicles, but couldn't slow in time to avoid colliding. So instead, he swerved into the lane of oncoming traffic, hitting another semi head-on mere moments after my step-siblings had pulled safely onto the driveway. 
The trucker who had been speeding somehow survived the accident. The other trucker that he hit was not so fortunate. After my stepmother returned, she allowed us to walk up and see the wreckage for ourselves. I remember seeing a lot of logs and twisted metal. I never watched a Final Destination movie, but I'm pretty sure I don't need to. Did you know that many Department of Defense transports, like military movements and nuclear shipments, occur in a clandestine manner? The secrecy is essential for national security reasons. I once knew someone who served in the National Guard motor pool. He never had detailed knowledge of the cargo being transported, but on two occasions he was issued loaded magazines for his sidearm, and his gunner carried a fully loaded M4 rifle. The instructions were crystal clear. Shoot first and ask questions later if anyone attempted to board, climb, or detain the truck. It was a very frightening experience for the driver, but he made it okay and managed to deliver the cargo, whatever it was, in one piece. But travelling up the road, thinking that at any moment someone can come and easily take your life for the cargo you are hauling, really makes for an unsettling experience and a drive that makes you clench your butt cheeks the whole way until you know you're out of harm's way. I don't think he carried on doing this after a while. It can be very taxing, living with that much fear while driving. And if you haven't experienced it, you might not even be able to appreciate just how absolutely terrifying this fear can feel to anyone. I believe I was in Texas or one of the surrounding states at the time, still in the training phase for my trucking job. While waiting for our appointment, my trainer and I stepped into a Love's truck stop for a much needed shower. This was a rare moment of privacy for my training, so I took my time luxuriating in the comfort of the warm water. Suddenly, the lights in the shower area went out, leaving only a faint emergency light flickering dimly. I initially thought it was some kind of automated signal indicating that I had exceeded a time limit or something. So I hurriedly finished rinsing off, and as I stepped out and began to dry myself, I absentmindedly checked my phone, only to be jolted by an emergency tornado notification and a text message from my trainer. He messaged me urgently, and instructed me to remain in the shower stall while he and the other customers sought safety in the freezer. The reality of the situation hit me like a ton of bricks. As I hastily dressed, the sound of the howling wind grew louder, and soon the entire building began to tremble violently. Coming from the serene mountains of the Pacific Northwest, I had never experienced anything like this before and fear gripped me as I contemplated the possibility of perishing in a truck stop shower stall. The thought was surreal and terrifying, that these were going to be my last pitiful moments on this earth. But miraculously, we weren't affected. The tornado did touch down nearby, causing significant damage and disturbance, but our truck escaped unscathed, and although the truck stop sustained some damage, it wasn't severe enough to endanger us any further. I arrived at a nearly deserted truck stop one night after a gruelling haul. I stepped out of the truck and sighed wearily. The air was heavy with the scent of diesel and distant sounds of highway traffic. As I trudged towards the entrance, the dim glow of flickering light revealed a chilling sight. A dark, shadowy figure, tall and imposing, draped in a threadbare brown suit and sporting a worn bowler cap. My tired eyes widened in disbelief as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. Was it a trick of the light? Before I could comprehend, I just blinked, and just like that he vanished into the ether, leaving behind an eerie silence that seemed to echo into the empty lot. The unnerving experience jolted me so intensely that my footsteps faltered. Every instinct screamed at me to turn back, to retreat into the safety of my truck, ignoring the pull of curiosity and the need for rest. I hurriedly shuffled towards my vehicle, the thudding of my heart matching the rhythm of my quickening pace. 
That night, cocooned within the familiar confines of my truck's cab, I tried to shake off the unsettling encounter. I chalked it up to exhaustion, the mind playing tricks on me after hours on the road. Yet despite my attempts to rationalise the memory, it lingered like an unwelcomed guest, casting a shadow over my thoughts, and leaving me haunted to this very day. My stepfather was a truck driver, and sometimes he would take family members along with him if it was a short trip. My son went with him on a trip to St. Louis once. They were just going down the highway and coming up to an overpass when some guy decided it would be a good idea to jump off. He was hit by a semi coming in the opposite direction as them. They say that as the guy hit the vehicle, he became pieces rather than people, and chunks of him fell everywhere. My son was nine, and he was never the same after witnessing that. My uncle drove trucks for over two decades, and he once shared a chilling tale when he found himself at a remote truck stop hungry and with no other options for miles around. Reluctantly, he sat down for a meal, hoping to satisfy his hunger before he hit the road again. But little did he know this stop would become a chapter in his book of chilling experiences. Because after finishing his meal and a quick pit stop, he stepped out of the restroom only to be greeted by flashing police lights. Bewildered, he learned of a brutal murder in the stall right next to him. The victim had been there for hours, but no one noticed, casting a pall over the truck stop. Despite his innocence, being questioned about a murder left my dad shaken to the core. Another time, during a delivery in Baltimore, Maryland, my dad faced a different kind of danger. A crazed individual wielding a hammer attacked his truck as he drove through the city streets. Quick thinking and fast driving sent the assailant tumbling to the ground, escaping harm. But such encounters were not rare in his line of work. Alongside the highways, my dad witnessed the aftermath of motorcycle accidents quite frequently, and would rather I never drove one. I was driving night shift in Arizona, and pulling a 28-foot trailer with flammable 3 hazmat. I had to go down a mountain to get to the valley, and since I was still green to truck driving when it came to mountains, as I learned how to drive in a flat state, mountains were new to me. I unfortunately made a near-fatal mistake. While I was ascending the top of the hill, I did not properly set myself up to descend down this hill by getting into a lower gear fast enough. I knew I needed to catch a lower gear, but I did it a little too late. By the time I tried getting the proper gear to descend the 18 mile grade on this mountain, it was already too late. I caught a bunch of momentum and started going 80 plus miles an hour stuck in neutral. And of course, when you're stuck in neutral, your engine brakes do not work. So I'm 80,000 pounds, full of flammable 3 hazmat, stuck in neutral, descending this hill at 80 plus miles an hour, catching my brakes on fire. When I realised what I had just done, I got calm and did the best I could, knowing I was most likely dead already. There was a slight curve at the bottom of the first hill. I was able to make the turn, and caught a slight incline that saved my life by breaking the momentum. I was able to pull into a rest area shortly thereafter, and yes, I'll admit it was a very big lack of experience on my part. But when I first got out on my own, I didn't have good training either. As a result, I am incredibly cautious of other truckers now, because I know a lot of the training they go through is very subpar, but not all of them. I'm just glad no one was around when my truck became a runaway train, as it could have very nearly ended in disaster. My dad was a trucker for years and years, and he said the scariest thing that ever happened to him was this. He was driving down a mountain in icy conditions, but they'd done a good job of salting the road, so he was doing all right. However, as he was coming down to the last bit of slope, there was a bridge, and bridges are notorious for being icy, even when the rest of the road is dry. 
The moment he hit that bridge, his trailer started coming around. He could see it coming at him in the mirror. And he said the rule is if your trailer passes 45 degrees, you're screwed with no hope of recovery. Hold on to your ass and hope for the best. Well, his trailer had passed 45 degrees and he was looking up ahead at the road on the far side of the bridge. It was bone dry. He knew in that moment he was dead. He would soon hit the dry pavement and all hell was gonna break loose. He kept looking in his mirror and watching his trailer stick out to the left and trying to find some way to save it, even though he knew he couldn't. But that dry spot was coming up quick. Only somehow when he hit the dry road, everything just instantly straightened up like there had been no problem at all. He pulled off onto the shoulder and parked to cry his eyes out and thank the powers in heaven and earth that he was still alive. I was driving across the old alligator alley in South Florida one day with a friend. We saw a big suitcase on the side of the road and I made a joke about a free suitcase and that we should pick it up. But of course we didn't. It wasn't until some time later that apparently it was an apparent mafia hit and the body was left in the suitcase so it could be found. That's pretty disturbing to think we drove right by it and I had a very clear thought for a minute to go get it. Another local story in my small town is that when I was at a stop sign one day and suddenly had a weird feeling you get when something isn't right, I look at the spot where the feeling was coming from and there was what looked like a huge, like near pony sized grey wolf with bright gold eyes staring at me. We look at each other for a few moments and then it turned and slowly walked away into the brush. Later a police officer friend asked me what I thought might be running around just outside of the town smashing through wooden fences and killing animals and then disappearing very quickly since no one knew what it was or had even seen it in action. I spent one year in Haslett, a tiny town near Fort Worth, driving home from parties in Dallas. I'd have to follow a lot of small roads with very little traffic, and one night in particular, it was around 2am, I drove past a cop that was parked on the side of the road, flashing lights on with no sirens, but it was empty. There weren't any other cars parked next to it and there were no other cops. I drove on and saw more of the same, just empty cop cars. Headlights on, lights flashing but quiet and empty. It was very eerie. The further I drive, the more cop cars I saw. Sometimes they were in groups of two or three, sometimes more. That was all over the course of a few miles in the middle of nowhere. Where the biggest crime you'd get would be a DUI. It was also foggy that night. So picture this, late at night dozens of abandoned cop cars with their doors open in some cases with flashing lights in the eerie silence, with a layer of fog all around. It was damn surreal. I still don't know what the hell that was. If anyone has a good guess, I'd appreciate it because the mystery has been on my mind for years. Maybe it was some sort of bizarre fraternal police order or secret ritual, I don't know. Because it was out in the middle of nowhere in fields between 2 or 3 a.m. So damn disturbing. Driving north from Grand Forks to Canada, very late at night, I saw a tail light a mile or so ahead and I'm slowly catching up to it. Then I see an intermittent flashing light that's yellow. The light is getting closer to me faster than the tail light and then in an instant I see a flash in front of me and realize it's a steel pole bouncing down the road towards me, making a bright spark with each bounce. Right then I watch it come within feet of my driver's mirror, right past me. It really shook me up, and then as I approached the car I realized what it was. It was one of the poles on the back of a boat trailer that is used to know where the back of the trailer is when it's submerged on a boat launch ramp. Every time I see a boat trailer on the highway, I think about how I was probably 10 feet away or less from taking a pole through the face. My dad ran a transport business in Victoria County, Australia, just outside a major metropolis. 
We had a contract that involved two drivers and two prime movers, tractors to our US cousins, driving in the metro about an hour each way, and short hauling trailers around the inner metro region for most of the day, and then returning home each night towing another trailer each for delivery in our immediate area. The drivers left in the dark and arrived home in the dark. One night one of them arrived at our back door, ashen faced and shaking. Dad brings him inside and mum makes him some food while we're finishing dinner and he says to dad that he thinks he needs some time off. Considering the state, dad agreed immediately and made a call to set up another driver to take his place the next day. The dude relax, eats and drinks and then dad finally gets the story out of him. There's a bit of fog around in midwinter and the guy drew the long straw, so he's on his way home when his mate in the other truck had the trailer that night. About 20 kilometers from town, the fog is thick, flat open plain that leads to the coast about 25 kilometers away, and he slows down and is almost at a standstill on the highway. But rolling forward, when an elephant walks out in front of the prime move, a big cab over Mercedes Benz, and across the two lanes in front of him, He's shaking again and tells my dad that the elephant looked at him. It did. A wildlife park was being set up just off the highway and they had gotten an elephant who got used to breaking out of his padlock in the first few months while they were still building and going for a wander. The local policeman told my dad later he would get a call at least once a week about the wandering Nelly, who loved to pinch Lucerne from a neighbor's paddock. This happened over a decade ago when I was in my teenage years. I witnessed a seasoned trucker freeze up during a harrowing bushfire in Texas. The trucker, claiming experience, had come to a standstill blocking westbound traffic in midst of the chaos. My dad, a no-nonsense driver, took charge over the CB radio, forcefully urging the trucker to move aside so he could forge ahead. The scene around us was apocalyptic. The air was thick with smoke, casting an ominous haze over the landscape. Everywhere we looked, either flames danced or the charred aftermath of the fire lay in eerie stillness. The fences lining the road were adorned with glowing red wires and a stark reminder of the intense heat that had swept through. Amidst the devastation, the sight of fire trucks desperately trying to protect a train loaded with coal caught our attention. The tracks on either side were aglow with heat, surreal and terrifying. To make matters worse, our truck's air conditioning had been malfunctioning for days, leaving us sweltering in the relentless Texas heat. For what seemed like an eternity, we crawled along the road, our progress hindered by the relentless blaze licking the edges of the highway. It took us a grueling three to four hours of nerve-wracking anticipation and careful maneuvering to finally leave the worst of the fire behind us. And if you haven't driven in fire, you have no idea just how scary it is and the fear that the fire will intensify and scorch you while you're sitting in your truck. I grew up in a trucker and mechanic family and was going to join the family business. At 16, I was on the road with my dad every summer because you have to learn sometime and this is how my dad taught me. There was a snowstorm in Kansas. Do you know where they can't drive in snow during a storm? Kansas. White knuckle tight as I passed wrecks and cars and other tractor trailers who had jackknifed. I begged my dad to take over, but there was nowhere to pull over. So I had to muscle through it. Looking out the driver's side window, I noticed a family in a caravan going backwards. I locked eyes with my father who locked eyes with me and just gave me a bewildered sad little smile before veering off hard to the left in a puff of white powder and disappearing from view. I'm sure they were fine, but I can still see his face to this very day. We were driving a dust cart in the UK with one driver and two crew members. On approach to a roundabout from a door carriageway, there is light traffic and clear visibility in the early morning. 
As I approach, I can see the three roads converging on the roundabout, as well as across the roundabout itself. There are two other vehicles that I'm aware of and tracking as I plan my own maneuvers and predict theirs. Coming to an almost stop before the giveaway line, I'm looking out of the driver window at the mirror and past it, there's nothing. Two cars I had been watching turned off. I'm clear to go. So I look forward and boom, there's a third red car just there that's moving at a snail pace in front of us seemingly appearing out of nowhere. It's as if we all manage to blink at the same time and somehow miss this bright red car on a clear day within 1.5 seconds or so. We all just kind of have a moment, saying where the hell did that come from? We waited while it shunted like someone bouncing on the clutch, and then it just went off down the road. I still have no words, I know what I saw, and so do the guys I was working with. The world seemed to skip a beat, and left the car in front of us it seems. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's collection of scary stories. If of course you did, you can let me know down below. It is very much appreciated. And I hope to see you in the next video. I'd like to extend a big thanks to all my members and patrons whose names can be seen on screen for their continued support. If you'd like to get your name in at the end of the video and a bunch of cool perks, you can follow the link in the description to find out more. But that's it from me. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one. Good night.